and at this age separate their beds from sleeping with each other. Prophet makes it very clear that look, at the age of seven, children have reached that age to where they can begin being encouraged to make the salat. But the salat is not wajib on them yet. Why does Allah make the salat wajib on the human beings only when they've reached the age of being balak, of maturity? Is because before this point their identity is still forming. Their conception of themselves, their personality, their responsibilities have not become full on them yet. They're still developing. But by the age of um, seven, Rasulullah is saying, you should begin encouraging them to make that salat. And not just salat, but those other acts also in Islam. Now, of course, fasting for the child of Ramadan is difficult, but young children usually fast till lunchtime, huh? It's at this age that we should begin encouraging the children to participate in Islamic affairs. And the reason for this is that it's at this age that they're becoming self-aware. Becoming aware of themselves and their surroundings and the influences on them. But by age 10, then Prophet says, and he's saying this regardless of male or female, then you should seriously admonish them. Now by age 10 for, for females, usually it's wajib on them by this time. They're wearing their hijab, they're making their salat, and it's wajib. But even for boys, the Prophet is saying, by age of 10, it should be seriously recommended to them. Not that you're forcing them, but seriously pushing them towards establishing the salat. Because by this age, they've developed to that extent that in reality, it's time for them to t begin taking this responsibility seriously. And these things have positive effects on the development of the child and the impact that it will have on their self-conception. But you know, no matter what type of influences our parents give us, no matter what our parents do for us and what type of advices they do for us and what type of care they take with us, at the end of the day, our identity is something that we choose, isn't it? I mean, really, we, we all have an identity that's given to us from our parents, from our communities, from our ethnic background or national background, and this is acceptable. But everyone reaches a stage in their development a place in their life when they decide who they are. Isn't that the truth? They decide that I'm this type of person. This is the way I'm going to be. This is the way I'm going to conceive of myself. So no matter what other influences there may be, society, family, friends, and these are really, family and friends are the two biggest and most important influences in developing a strong and positive identity. When people come and say, Oh Mawlana, my son has gone astray and he doesn't pray anymore. My first question is, who does he hang out with? Who does he hang out with? Who's his friends? Because you see, the quickest, easiest way to influence someone is through their friends. If this person is hanging out and spending time with mu'mineen who pray and fast, that will influence him. And if not, they also will influence him. Family and friends are a big influence. But at the end of the day, we choose who we are. We decide to define ourselves. And this is why I've always enjoyed and always admired the story of Hazrat al-Hurat al-Yazid al He's a beautiful example of this concept of identity that we choose. Hazrat al was from the tribe of Banu Tamim. It's a very large and powerful tribe. He had received a government post as a soldier. And little by little he worked his way up in the military until he was put in command of a small contingent. And this was his rank that he commanded a force of around about a thousand men. I don't know what we would call that in today's military terminology, but this was who God was. This is the type of person he was that when he was given a mission by his commanders, he was that type of person that always accomplished it. 
He was described by those contemporaries of his day as one of the bravest men of Kufa. That when they decided that they would make a list as an example of the brave men in Kufa, Hazrat Ahmad Yazid would be near the top. He's known as a brave man, known as a captain and a commander of men and a leader of men. And it just so happens that it falls on Hazrat Ahmad Yazid to head out from Kufa and to intercept the caravan of Imam Hussein والسلام, and stop him wherever he may find him and stop him from reaching the city of Kufa. Hazrat Ahmad, he accepts his words. Al Rasi, Chash, your will is my command. And he goes out, he takes his soldiers, and they begin this ordeal that over the next few days they begin looking for the caravan of Imam Hussein. They've been sent to intercept his caravan and to stop that caravan. They were in the desert for a number of days searching for Imam Hussein trying to bar his access to Kufa. And as it happened, they had run out of water. You know, the desert is a very dangerous, dangerous, dangerous place. If you don't know your way around, if you don't know your landmarks and can't find your way and get lost in the desert with little or no water, you're finished. To this day, you still hear about people with all the GPS we got, turn left at the next signal. To this day, you still hear about people dying in the desert. You go out, your car breaks down, you didn't pack enough water, the next thing you know, you're a pile of bones. Hazrat Tahurat Yazid, his forces, they were lost in this desert, they had run out of water. Hazrat Imam Hussain as his caravan is going towards Kufa, one of his companions in this caravan calls out, Allahu Akbar. Imam Hussein says, Allahu Akbar, for what? This man says, I see date palm trees. You know in the pirate movies, when they show you one man sitting at the top of the ship looking out for land, and he would say, land ho. In the desert it's like this also. There's no natural features around you, so when you look out, you're looking for little specks of thing that may be an oasis, maybe some shade. And this guy, he sees in the distance what seems to be a date palm grove. He calls out Allah Akbar. The other companions of Imam Hussein, they say, you know, there's no date palm oasis in this area. And as they look closer, they see that these aren't date palms at all. They are spears that are being held up and the ears of horses that are being seen from a distance. So that this young man, he thought he was seeing an oasis, but what he was actually seeing was the contingent of Hazrat Ahur coming near to Imam Hussain. One of these companions of Imam Hussain, they say, hey, this is not date palms. This is horses. Imam Hussein says, is there anywhere in this area that we can make a camp, a defensive camp, he says. Anywhere there to defend ourselves. There was a little hill called the Husn, just a little distance from them. And Imam Hussein turned to his left and began moving towards this hill. As his caravan reaches to this hill, the contingent of Hazrat Ahur ibn Yazid arrives. And they were under orders not to arrest Hussain, not to get bail from him, but to stop him where you find him and then send message to us. So even members of Ahl al-Bayt they say that when this contingent of Hur arrived, that they arranged themselves in front of Ahl al-Bayt that the horses were snorting in the faces of the caravan of Imam Hussein, and that their flags, their banners, were fluttering over the heads of Ahl al-Bayt. This is how close they came to that assembled caravan of Imam Hussein. And they stayed there in this way 